So this is our first official school counselor network meeting of the year. It is so nice to have people live in front of us. We're just getting started doing that. Uh, after, of course, all of your last year not having anyone in the building. So it's so exciting to see people. So if we have not met, my name is Lynn April. I am the Director of Education for Economic Development here at CESA 8. Um, I am kind of taking on the School Counselor Network meeting two years ago. John Knickerbocker, who was our local vocational education coordinator, uh, was the one who did the uh, School Counselor Network meetings. And then last year during the craziness of COVID, it kind of went by the wayside and then John retired. So we now have a new local vocational education coordinator, Val Brooks, who is in a meeting this morning, but she's going to stop in later on give us a little <clears throat> information about what she's doing with Carol Perkins. And then we will also have Lisa Misco, who is our special ed director, um, who will be on occasion uh, coming to some of the meetings to share information. She sent me some great suggestions this morning with them, some things that she could share in November. Uh, one of the topics that came up when we had our planning meeting in August was trauma-informed um, care and trauma-informed in the classroom. And so she has a speaker who has information on that. So we will make sure that we get that coordinated at some point during the year. Oh. So we are going to uh, be doing some introductions shortly and then uh, this is the plan for the agenda. We didn't have, when we had our planning meeting, there was a lot of like crickets when I said, what do you want to do? Because this is really your network meeting. So, um, so I've got a bunch of things in the agenda today that we can do, but if there are things that we get to one point and it's like, we just want to sit and talk to each other. Uh, we don't need to do this part. I'm more than happy to do that. So this is very much suggestion. Um, we do, and I sent this out yesterday, so I'm sure that you all got it. Every year we do have to update our contact information because of the WEC survey that is uh, coming out on academic and career planning. So I'm set aside some time for us to do that here so that way we've got it done. Uh, we also have this year returning the community of practice webinars from on uh, ACP from the EPI. And there's a brand new self-assessment guide for academic and career planning that was discussed at the first community of practice. I just want to make sure everybody's aware of that and what that does. And then my suggestion is we have a, a number of copies of a book that just came out called Powerful Partnerships, a teacher's guide to engaging families and student success. So my suggestion is that we do a book study and do one chapter each time that we have one of our meetings. And I've got enough copies for everybody um, online as well to uh, have three copies of this. And I actually found a really nice book study of the book. So that's something that if, if you'd rather not do that. So think about that uh, during the break. You can still have the book, but we don't have to do the book study if that's something that you're not interested in and you have other things you would like to talk about instead. Uh, Val will stop in hopefully around 1110. I'll check with her and make sure that works for her uh, just to give us an update on what's happening with Carl Perkins. This year is the year that a comprehensive local needs assessment needs to be sent to students and parents and community members for your district to get Carl Perkins funding. And so I'm, we have a workshop coming up on the at the end of October to help your Carl Perkins coordinator get that survey together and sent out, but um, she'll, I'm sure we're sharing the information with you as well. And then the plan is lunch at 1130 so that those who are who is staying for the deck meeting this afternoon, almost everyone, awesome, that Steph will just be coming in and transitioning and then the afternoon will be all of that. So that is the plan. So I thought rather than traditional introductions, we're still going to do introductions, but I thought that doing something kind of fun that perhaps you could also use with students uh, as you are thinking about academic and career planning, uh, that we could work that in. So I don't know if any of you have ever taken a personality test. We actually had a few years ago, we have a CISA University Day 
in September, every single person who worked for every CISA in the state did the DISC uh, personality assessment test, and it was to help us understand how to work with each other better. It's really fun. Um, so I have a free one that I found online um, that I would like you to actually, morning, Craig, click into and take. And then you're going to introduce yourself with the result that you got on the Instagram test. So you don't, because it's a free version, you don't get uh, a full report on everything that uh, you align with, but it really gets a lot of good information. And as you're taking it, also thinking about how might you or your teachers use this with students. So for every comment, you score them from one disagree to five agree. And then at the end, you will get a result. So I'm going to give you, um, and Kira, hopefully you are also in it, and Craig just got here, so I'm going to give him the link uh, to the slide deck. But please go through and answer. I think there are about 20 questions. It doesn't take very long. But answer the questions and see what you get for a result. And then we're going to go around and it's mine just keeps asking me. Oh, so let me go back you, Craig. Here's the, the bit.ly. We'll get you into the slide deck. Yep, and then just scroll down. It should be. Oh. <laughs> yep. Uh, C W open. Yeah. So then, if you would like to, once you get situated there, sure. uh, log in, and then I've got the bitly up on the screen that you can get into the slide deck. We were actually taking the personality test, and then we're going to introduce ourselves with our. I love how to say it. I'm a neogram. I'm a neogram. A neogram. Are you guys So we are just getting into the slide deck, and then everybody's taking a personality test in order to introduce themselves. We did the bit we is up on the screen. We're doing that right. We're doing yep. So once you get into the slide deck, then if you would go to slide three and click on the Enneagram personality test, it takes you to uh, a free <coughs> test, and then you just answer disagree to agree on each one of the statements. So you get to, uh, a result. Did you send us something or I just go to the bit.ly? So if you go to the bit.ly and then uh, once you get into the, the slide deck, go to slide three. Um, 
CA open does not need If I'm in Mars, I know <coughs> that if you don't log in from school first. Backslash. It is five days. Because I'm standing here. Can't walk away, it'll be fine. <laughs> Third slide. Got it. Yeah, slide three. Yep. Oh, I got a different school this time that I did last time. <laughs> They're constantly changing. Apparently, depends on yeah where exactly. Oh, how you're feeling from day to day. <laughs> well, I took it last night at like eleven o'clock, so apparently yeah. <laughs> you were tired. <laughs> And now you're refreshed. I think last night was was uh, closer. No, oh, I don't know. It was the get started for you one night. It says like enneagram, right, yeah. kind of in the middle yeah. of the. If you click on the free enneagram personality test, <laughs> then go, just yep, go down, and the quiz should be right there. Yep. So okay. then you just start. Oh. So it's um, like I said, we did a, a very broad, um, very involved uh, personality test when we had the CC University a few years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. So it gave us very specific um, results on the DISC assessment that we did. But these are the types that are included in this particular test. You've got the idealist, the caregiver, the performer, the creative, the thinker, the loyalist, the adventurer, the protector, and the peacekeeper. And then from there, if you actually purchase um, your full results, it'll let you know if you're on one side or the other of a particular type, because if you are a type one, you could also be an optimist or you could be an activist. Um, when you get the free results, it doesn't give you all of those, but if you um, just I don't know. If you scroll down, it really does give you a lot of information, uh, even without purchasing all of the results. So you get information on your particular type. And like I said this uh, morning, apparently I'm an idealist, but last night I was uh, a protector. So it gives you um, the, an overview and some good descriptions of that particular personality type, um, your basic desire, your fears, communication style. We talked a lot about that when we did this uh, for CC University. And then the wings are the ones that um, are on either side of your particular type. Uh, and then it goes into um, yeah, more of the information about each of the ones. But then if you go to your particular 
uh, type and you put learn more about it, again, gives you a lot more information about the personality traits, the strengths, the weaknesses of this personality type, um, growth opportunities, what it's like to uh, work with somebody who is this personality type, their motivations, their stresses, their careers, usually. Um, so, so yes, I the one that I got this morning uh, works good with exactly what you do with being a school counselor. Um, and then professional relationships, romantic relationships, some famous examples of people who are that particular personality type. So that was interesting. Actually, this probably is better because uh, the people who were online from last night were kind of scary. And there's even a slideshow about it. So what I'd like to do, for those of you who are still taking the test, go for it. Uh, but I'd like to go around the room and also online. We've got a couple of our folks online. And have you introduce yourself with your name, your district. I know we have some new folks this year. Um, your enneagram type, yanagram type. And then just thinking about how might you use this information with students if you had them take. Uh, the personality test doesn't take very long. It gives you some good information. Of that information that we just scrolled through, like what do you think would be something that either would be fun for kids to find out about or even um, something that would be interesting to use with students to help them know each other better. So I'm going to start over on this side of the room with Abby, and we'll just go around it, and then I'll, I'll have our online folks <laughs> unmute themselves. So Abby. <laughs> Um, I'm Abby Banky. I'm the middle and high school counselor in Bowler. I got the caregiver. Um, so I am generous, altruistic, and empathetic. I don't know if I agree all the time, <laughs> uh, but I would say, yeah, that like how other people feel really impacts me. So I can see that. Um, I feel like this is a lot like what they do on Zello with, mm. um, for students. And I think that Knowing a personality type is really helpful in helping your students to choose the path to success. Awesome. Okay, Beth, did you get a chance to pick yeah. or you still work? I'm a caregiver also. Okay. I'm Beth Tishek, the high school counselor at Bondwell High School. I'm a caregiver also. Looks like perfectionist, ethical, and motivated. I'm not sure, or no. Am I in the right? That's idealist. Helpful, generous, and warm hearted. Says that they make great counselors. I guess I'm in the right job. Yeah. <laughs> Phew. I know. So we don't even do it like forever, right? So <laughs> um, I don't so know. So, do you do something like this with students, or could you see doing something? Like I this don't, with but yeah, we. I mean, that we teach that eighth grade cruise class. It might be something just to help them be self-aware a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. It really, when we took it just within um, our CIA department, um, it was really, it, it helped us to understand why it is that some of us have interests or um, have specialized in certain areas based on what those personality types were about. So it really helped us to, to know better um, working with each other. Okay, and over here. Uh, I'm Holly Prinzel. I am the elementary school counselor here at Gillette Elementary. I am also a caregiver. <laughs> so, so how far up do you go? Uh, fifth grade. Okay. Yeah. Four K through five. All right. Wonderful. Okay. Um, I'm Craig Rackham, the seven to twelve school counselor at Marion High School and Junior High. Um, I was also a caregiver on this one. <laughs> so. Continuing the trend, um, I do I do a personality test with all my students every every year, oh, cool. um, especially with seventh grade too. And I, it's not only do we I, I kind of do the, the or more like a Myers Briggs type mm -hmm. type personality yep. test, but I, we kind of break those down to kind of break down each letter to kind of see what each letter means for them, but also then how it relates to them working in groups with certain types of people that maybe. If maybe it was one that likes to get things done ahead of time, more ahead of time, the other one's more of a procrastinator, how that can sometimes create some conflict within group group type activities and what they can do to maybe realize maybe those differences with, with people around them to help them get along better with each other. Great ideas. I love that. And we also show that with kid parents at parent or when we do our different conference too, so that's always kind of nice 
relationship builder with them too, they kind of start to see some of the same things at home. Right. Right. Well, um, I'm Chelsea Spansky. I'm the elementary school counselor. Um, I also got caregiver. <laughs> Um, I do not do a personality test, but I could see maybe like doing with fifth grade. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'd want to go too much lower, but fifth grade, I think I could do it with. And is that at the top of the? That's my top. Yeah. I'd be the rest of it. Sixty for all of them, you know. Um, we do the personality profiles in Zello as well. Any self awareness is helpful in picking anything, and we also share it during our um, eighth and tenth grade individual planning conferences. Just any awareness that the parents can have of their children is also helpful. Yes, absolutely. And one of the things that we have found in um, just talking to, to you about your students working with Zello, we find that middle school students are much more happy to engage with um, Zello sometime yes. when they get to high school. They've seen it, they're, they're not as excited about it. So one of the things that um, and I'll talk about the, uh, the, the lessons that we've been creating uh, through the ACP uh, grant. But with the high school lessons, we're trying to bring in more outside um, tools like this so that students aren't necessarily always on Zello all of the time, so that they understand that there are other tools that are out there that they can use for careers as well. Okay. I'm Tori Wanless. I'm the K 12 counselor at Tigerton. Um, and I also got caregiver, so I agree with that. And this is your second, your second, second year, or year, second year, second year, second year. Okay. All right. And you go. All right. So I'm Shelby Kaisershot. I'm actually brand new. I'm actually at Coleman, so I'm actually not new to Coleman because I actually interned with Lindsay Allen, the old high school counselor. She's actually in Luxembourg Casco now. Um, so I was actually interning with her last year, and then in 2019. So I'm familiar with Coleman because I I was there with her interning, but I'm new. To the position. So I'm actually in a brand new position at Coleman. I'm not the high school counselor, I'm the school success coordinator. So it's a brand new position Coleman added this year. I'm actually K-12 and I've been meeting with a mixture of students, um, but I'm also the DAC too. So I'm taking over that as well. Um, so yeah, like I said, I'm new there. Um, so I got caregiver too. I feel like I'd be surprised if everybody doesn't get caregiver at this point. <laughs> um, however, school counselors, I did graduate from Lakeland with my school counseling degree last year. So. But prior to that, I did work with a, a federal program that was called WIOA. Some people might be familiar with it, but um, I worked in O'Connell County for the last six and a half years doing that. So I'm familiar with a lot of personality tests. I use Career Locker, which actually is going away now, but they did a personality assessment on there with my. I worked with mainly 16 to 24 year olds. So that's my prior experience. So I, I love personality tests. I think it's a great way for them to discover more about themselves. So I definitely see us implementing that using Zello. And I know Ms. Allen and Lindsay did, did that too, so I'll definitely be using that still too. But I did the 16 personality one before, mm -hmm. the full one, yeah, like our company bought a couple years ago. Yeah, and it's awesome to find out more about you. It's like so accurate, it's just kind of creepy. <laughs> so that's when we found it. it was like, oh, this really knows me well. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and that. Well, I'm Shelby Kaiser Shot. I'm the school counselor in Florence. Nice to be back, like in the building. Man. It's been like, I think two years. So uh, I'm a thinker. So <laughs> I'm like, please don't be a caregiver. So um, I am not a caregiver. And sometimes I feel like I don't connect with my colleagues. And <laughs> I'm saying why. So, um, we need you. We need you. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't Maybe you're me. one of the wings. You're, you're more the philosopher. Thing. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I was just uh, emailing my we do a seventh and eighth grade uh, guidance lessons and I partner with the family consumer teacher. And so we, we were into trying all these different things. So I think this could be something to work with some of the students that are a little disengaged mm -hmm. because they're just, you know, it's a hard time at the school. So maybe if they kind of understand themselves better and why they're doing what they're doing, we can help them learn. So. Awesome. All right. And then online we have Chris. Me? Hey, Chris. Hi. Am I late? All right. Go ahead and introduce yourself and uh, tell us what you got. Did I, I think I came in late. Oh, okay. We. Um, I'll give you the the link to the slide deck, and we just um, there was a personality test on slide three. 
that I, we had everybody tape and they're talking about what they got for their personality type. But uh, let me actually, I'll just drop the, Hmm. I'll go into the chat and drop it in there, and then you can get into the slide deck from there. Right. Chris, you want to tell us the uh, district that you're with and the grades that you've covered? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, from Pembine. I'm the school counselor at Pembine. And she covers everything. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, how about Kira? Hello, um, my name is Kira Lee Noble. I am the elementary school counselor at Marion. Um, we are a 4K to 6 building, and I am a caregiver. Ouch, and I just stubbed my toe on my desk. <laughs> Well, you are in good company, Kira, because we have a, a room full of caregivers. <laughs> okay, thank you. And Sherry. Um, I'm Sherry Petcher. Uh, my video is not really working real well right now, so I'll leave. Oh, okay. From Niagara, um, I'm K-12, and um, I am a caregiver. <laughs> oh, that was funny. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much for, for uh, taking right. the, the quiz. I just thought it was a really fun way to start us off and think about other tools that we can use with students. Uh, so just to go back for those who, who joined us, um, this is the agenda, but it is very uh, flexible. So as we start getting into some of these things, if there is time that you need to, to do more networking instead of some of the things that I have planned, uh, we can absolutely do that. When we had our planning meeting in August, it was uh, pretty quiet as far as what kinds of, of information you wanted at the meeting. So I just put all kinds of things into our agenda for today. And Yesterday, that's because we but, know you're awesome and you'll you'll do whatever. I will try. And we'll love it. Uh, so the the dates, and I did end up changing the November dates because uh, Abby clued me into the fact that the first date that I had was right in the middle of the WISCA. Um, conference, so that would not have been good. Uh, we are, uh, for next month, November 18th, I do have a full day plan, and that one will start at 8.30 instead of 9. So if you're going to be here live, just keep that in mind, because the first thing that we're going to do is jump into the ACP community of practice that morning. That is the same day that that is, and it starts at 8.30. So we're going to make sure that we join them uh, for the community practice, that'll be 8.30 to 10. And then from there, Tammy Moynihan is going to join us with some information on the brand new math standards that are coming out. And so how that might impact your district. And Lisa, like I said, also had some things that she emailed me this morning that she thought would be good pieces of information for you to know about as school counselors. And then the plan for the afternoon is we've got some great workshops designed around um, the framework of poverty that's Ruby Payne's work and I know some districts have have done some of that work already some of you maybe don't have as much information about how poverty impacts your students you see that but when I went through this training with Steph and I definitely have gotten the, the informal training she went to like a week-long training and is the, the official um, person who can do the workshops on uh, the framework of poverty. It's amazing the information that uh, that particular organization has and Ruby Payne has done a lot of work uh, with poverty over the years. So I'm planning on, on sharing some information that I think that you'll, you'll learn some things that you, you uh, possibly did not know before. So that is the, the plan right now for the November full day. That's the only full day we're going to have. Then uh, December, January, February, and April, we skipped March because we know that many of you are off doing uh, spring breaks in March. So it was much easier to just avoid all of that. We will go back to the half day of that and half day of school counselor network. Um, it's going to flip back and forth what comes first because it depended on what Steph and I had going on. 
So December, January, February, she's going to do the app in the morning, and then we'll do this in the afternoon. We'll always have lunch available uh, if you're here live, and then April, we're flipping back again. So last month, no, uh, two months ago already, in August, I shared uh, a little bit of information about what, how the verbiage is changing slightly from the EPI around ACP. You're going to hear a lot more this year about career readiness first, and then ACP, because career readiness is really the overarching goal that we're looking at for academic and career planning and for the state. That overarching goal is all students at graduate college and career ready. ACP is then the process that we use to get students to that career readiness goal. The pathways you're going to be hearing more about, and I did quite a, a, an in depth um, look at the pathways at our August meeting, and I can definitely send the link out if you weren't at that August meeting and you want to learn more about the pathways. That's really the organizing structure that we're using for getting kids ready post-graduation, and then we've got career-based learning experiences and industry-recognized credentials that we hope students can take advantage of as they are in high school preparing for their careers. And then, of course, we have the Zello and Inspire tool that students can use to do that planning. So yesterday, I sent out uh, some, some to-dos. So one is every year we need to update our district contacts for ACP and Zello, uh, because we have a survey that goes out every year. <coughs> Wisconsin Education, oh, it's WEC, and now I'm forgetting what WEC stands for, uh, but uh, you've got a handout, so I'll show you in a second. Um, but we do need to make sure that every middle and high school has a contact for ACP and career readiness, <coughs> and we share that with the WEC organization. So on slide six, there is a link to the ACP survey contacts, and you all should have access to edit, not just to look at it. So I have highlighted everything in yellow, and that means that I don't yet know if this is all up to date. So what I would like you to do is spend a couple of minutes, look through your particular district, make sure that the contact person for elementary, middle, and high school is accurate, the email is accurate. Um, if the school, if your title isn't in there, please include it. And then also, if we don't yet have a URL for your website, uh, for the ACP section of your website, because your ACP plan by PI 26 is supposed to be posted to your district website, please include that URL. And then once you get that done, if you would just go over and highlight and take out the yellow by either resetting or clicking on white. Once I see white, I know that you've looked this over and it is all accurate and then I don't have to email you anymore uh, to ask you to make sure that everything is up to date. So if you could take a couple minutes to look over that. Mine is not on there. So. I see that. <laughs> I see that. So email. Which has been a problem for <laughs> since I joined. Well, you don't really have a middle school. No, Jamie is high school, middle school. Okay. All right. So there we go. So I'll talk to Jamie here. Put her down for middle school as well, and then you can put your information in there. be updating our, our links with more like with the career readiness language because ours is a lot of academic career planning still or is that um or is it just too okay. to start changing oh no it is it's, they've, they've always talked about career readiness it's just this year they're really much more intentional about talking about that first before ACP. but um, i um, if you want to do that, if you've got time to do that, that would be awesome, Zach. I'm much more interested in making sure that like everybody's plan is really what you're doing. So I'm not as, as concerned with the language. I would love it to be like if I go on the website and see your ACP page that it's, yep, that's what we're doing with our kids. So the link you have for 
Tigerton is the old school counselor's website. Okay. So I don't want to have one yet. Okay. Do you want me to update that one or if you have, so if you don't have anything yet for yours, like if, if we click on that, will it go to that? Picture? It'll go to hers, like what she did before. Okay. So what for now, because you don't have yours developed yeah. yet, just you leave can it. just leave that. Okay. But um, when you do have yours developed, and I would rather than putting it specifically under like your name, it would probably be easier so that you don't have to make that change when the new person comes in if you had like an ACP page in general. On our website? Yeah. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. yeah I agree. But once you um, make the switch, then just send me the link. And okay. So I have a question for you about yes. that. November 18th. Based on oh, what you're yeah. saying, probably all three of our counselors should be there. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? Absolutely. Got yeah, social emotional, is... you know, Natalie, right? Mm -hmm. Social emotional, obviously, poverty huge. And then mm -hmm. I also told David that he should probably be at all of these meetings because mm -hmm. we have elementary counselors here as well. So you're on the same page with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to send to them immediately. So I, um, I sent, when I sent that email out yesterday, David's email bounced back to me. So I didn't know if he was still. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's weird. Yeah, and yours should not. So yeah, that'd be strange. Yeah. Okay. Then once you have that, then the other one, and this is new this year, we haven't had to do this before, but Zello also um, has always required that you have someone in your district that is like the Zello person. Um, so that would be the person who makes sure that like the new students get uploaded uh, the next year and that staff all has access. So for this one, because this is Zello's sheet, you just have to scroll down until you get to CISA 8. And then once you get to CISA 8, you should see your district listed. If you don't see your district listed, it might be because you have not had a person who was the Zello person before. And then um, if you see down here on the bottom with the links, there is a, a page that says without leads. And there are a few school districts like Tigerton. There wasn't one listed. I now have taken your information. I put it on page. Okay. Uh, but Florence says they, did, they don't have one. So Zach, I will take your information and have it take one. Um, Gresham, Marinette, like Marinette, how did they not have a lead? They've got how many school counselors? Uh, sorry, so if you aren't on that first page, check the second page. And if you put your information on the second page, I'll move it to the first page afterwards. But again, just make sure that the information is accurate. They do want. Uh, there we go. Um, first name, last name, title, phone number they want, uh, and email. So if you could update your information on that sheet, that would be really helpful. And I will not include you in any other emails that I send out about updating your information. And the reason that we do this is, and if you, um, did anybody not grab the book and the handout on your way in? I did not. I okay. didn't have any you. Can see oh, that. Here. I, I forgot to register for the meeting, so I didn't even have a name tag. <laughs> so, okay. Okay. Yeah. Good. 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 Yep. All right. And WEC stands for Wisconsin Evaluation Collaborative. So, from the beginning of doing academic and career planning, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. From the beginning of doing academic and career planning, there you go. Um, we have the, the we, as in the DPI has contracted with the Wisconsin Evaluation Collaborative to do a survey every year. Do you need the book as well? Yes. Okay, there you go. Uh, how ACP is going in the state. So they have I didn't get one either. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. There you go. Thank you. So they have since, oh, for sure since 2017, but I think even prior to that, they have sent a survey out every year, and this is why we gather these your addresses and make sure that the information is up to date. So this is our latest survey results. 
from last year's survey. So for those of you who are online, I have a link to the survey on slide seven. Those in the room have paper copies of it, uh, but you can go to the link as well. And this will give you an idea of, this is specific to CSA 8. So here's our results from last year's survey. Uh, we had 25 folks that filled in the survey, and that could be anybody that is on that, that sheet, basically. Um, so it was not only sent to school counselors, but in some cases, I think it was even sent to administrators. So of our districts, we had 25 that returned the survey. So we were at a 42% response rate. I'm hoping that our response rate goes up a bit for this year. It would be nice to have some more responses from our districts. And it says that respondents did include principals, ACP coordinators, and school counselors. So one of the very first things they asked was in light of COVID, um, what percentage of your ACP programming actually got completed? And I actually did a survey when COVID started last year, so in May, asking the exact same thing. Uh, and the results that I found were very, very similar to what the state found, which was that about 16% of our districts did out all of the ACP they were planning on doing with students. Uh, then about 16% got three quarters done, 16% got about half done, 28% got maybe 25% done, 24% uh, were uh, less than a quarter of what you were planning on getting done. And none of the districts that completed the survey said they opted out of ACP. I think we did have, like, I think Florence actually, you guys had um, submitted the opt out for last year. I believe that did. I'm okay. pretty sure. I think, I think you guys, you, you might have been the only ones uh, that did the opt out. And that was uh, something that you could do. Um, there were a lot of the EPI initiatives that your district could opt out of last year because of COVID. So it just gives us some really good information about how COVID impacted the different, the individual ACP activities, uh, stakeholder awareness and engagement. So how much are you engaging with families, with your post-secondary institutions, with your local businesses and community organizations? Uh, your practices and level of implementation, culture and structure and prioritization of ACP. So um, this is based on the, the survey that the self-assessment that your district can do. So are you just at the spot where you're, you're just starting with this, which is initiated? Is this something that you know, you've been doing for a number of years now that's pretty well implemented or institutionalized is this is something that we do so automatically. It's so much a part of how we do business in our district that it's part of the institution now or not started at all. So uh, again, you can see where we are with uh, some of those components, things like having full staff participation is definitely an area that we're still working on in CESA 8 uh, in many of our smaller districts. We know that the lion's share of the work falls on your shoulders, even though I constantly am messaging to administrators, this is not the job of school counselors, not the job of school counselors, this is not the job of school counselors. We know that in practice, it definitely uh, falls on you a lot of the time. Um, ACP practices, level of implementation for family engagement, and we know that that can be difficult, which is why um, the suggestion is with the book study that we're going to be doing to improve family participation. Uh, the ACP practices and level of implementation of, around curriculum, around career based learning, um, your post secondary opportunities, around your connection to student goals. You can see ACP opportunities and level of provision to interested students. So, um, how many of your students are getting the opportunity to? engage in AP classes, for example, or go to career fairs or have dual credit opportunities, again, in light of COVID last year. Not surprising that when we look at things like job shadowing and uh, career fairs, that um, it, it was not something that happened as often as have been happening in the past. Uh, reasons for not providing ACP opportunities. So looked at things like insufficient funding, 
availability of activity in your area. So if you have business, if you don't have businesses that open their doors to company tours, for example, that can be difficult. Uh, insufficient staff capacity, uh, challenges connected to COVID-19. So here's where you really see like 75% of career fairs didn't happen because of COVID last year. 64% of job shadowing didn't happen because of COVID. Uh, and then determinants of allocation of ACP opportunities. So how is it that um, students engage with some of these things? Um, do you have a dedicated ACP time or how is it that ACP is delivered in your particular district? And what does that look like as far as, as, far as the characteristics? And then um, what percentage of different ACP areas? The question was, what is one of like, what is your best practice in your district? And so 14% of districts said it was their final project. 10% said it was their alignment with CP. 24% said that it was the fact that they got a dedicated ACP time, for example. Uh, supported ACP related high school practices and characteristics of those practices. And then just some summaries. So I'd like to give you just a, a five minutes or so to look through the survey, whether it's the paper or the <laughs> online version. And the, yeah, just look at some of the information and then we're going to have a, a short discussion about like what are some of the findings that uh, you saw that you're not surprised at. Um, maybe something that you were surprised at, something that in your district you are, you definitely know that it's something that you are working toward, for example. So I'm going to stop talking for about five minutes and let you look through the survey and then we'll have some discussion around what you noticed, what you saw. Hey, Lynn. Yep. Can I get a link for that survey? Because I don't have that. Sure. So did you? Oh, so um, I'm sorry. I was going to give you the link to the whole slide deck. So let's go back to. Sorry about that. No, nope. thank you for reminding me. So here's the link to the whole slide deck, Chris. And it is case sensitive. Oh, that's right. I did put it in the chat. So you might be able to just click on it in the chat and go right to it. Were you able to get the slide deck, Chris? I got. I have the slide deck. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. And then if you go to slide seven, yep. And then click on where it says link to web survey. That will take you right to it. Perfect. Thank you.
Dr. Lynn. Yes. I have a quick question. Um, has anyone brought up the idea of having um, a, like a brochure with the different pathways? Um, we did this in Michigan years ago where um, like, the um like an agriculture path or brochure with with the different types of things that would fall under that and then the types of classes that you would take with it or for the different programs I, i'm not explaining myself very well but i can't remember if how many um clusters we had but each cluster had a brochure like a different brochure and the careers within that cluster and what classes you have to take you know to graduate and then classes you ought to be taking um for those career clusters so years ago um what the state of wisconsin did was called programs of study pos's and a lot of districts incorporated that into their um, your course handbook, and it did exactly that. It said, if you are interested in agriculture, um, here are the types of careers that are available, here are the classes that you should take. Um, so, so yes, um, that was done, and a lot of districts, like I said, adopted that years ago. Mm -hmm. um, the idea behind the, the pathways now is to take that kind of information, but make it very specific to your particular School district. So now instead of a general advanced manufacturing, um, and here's you know generally the types of classes you should take, it's at our particular school district, here are our classes that you should take. Here are complementary classes, here's the work-based learning that you can do. So the pathways work that's being that that started last year really comes from that whole idea of programs of study, which is exactly what you talked about. Okay, yeah, and like our career pathway uh, brochures were school specific. It was basically designed for our district because mm -hmm. every dis every school within the two county district um, had different offerings and things like that. So um, we put down exactly what we you know we felt was necessary, and then would make changes when things you know changed. Yeah. And I would say that that uh, with a lot of districts, they still have that as part of their their course handbook. Um, so so I would say that yeah, that is in many of our districts that's available, and that the, the additional thing that the, the pathways um, is doing is adding specifically the work based learning opportunities that are available at your district and the um, industry recognized credentials that students can get while they're still in high school, which wasn't part of that program of study work that was done initially. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I do like the idea of a brochure though, to hand to a student. Mm -hmm. like, we're there. Yeah, our kids used it, you know, they would mm -hmm. they would pull it and take a look at it and um they could see, you know, if they if they are going into building trades, if that was a part of their interest in, in that that cluster, then they would see what classes that they had that they should be taking in our within our own district, you know, as fre soft or freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, um, and they were able to kind of track. It was more like a tracking almost. Mm -hmm of what classes you ought to be doing and you know like i said we had i don't know eight or nine i can't remember exactly um different brochures and they were in different colors and you know they were nice brochures um for the kids and it was made by um the local uh tech school that we had available to us and Every district had their own. I don't know. It was it was pretty cool. Yeah, and I would say that that is what 
the, the pathways work is trying to do, but rather than a printed a printed brochure, um, instead it is because so much of it is live linked now. And the BTC, I think, has pathways listed. So just to give you an example, if we go to the districts that have created the regional career pathways, so I'll go to yours. Um, the, the reason that we're getting away from paper and going to online is because every one of these careers is live linked that students can get information on. And then we also have a live link to the post-secondary options, which sends them to a DPI page that shows students in my area of the state, if I'm interested in production for manufacturing, here are the registered apprenticeships that are available. Uh, here are the certificates and technical diplomas. Here are the associate degree options at the institutions in my area. So because of all the live links, they're really, um, that's what the Pathways is doing something, I think, very similar to what you're talking about. Because here, right. you know, here specifically in our district, here's what you should take. Here's some alternate classes that would also be helpful. Here's our work-based learning. Um, here are our transcripted classes. But because so much of it is now live linked, um, rather than having paper copies, they want to send students to the so that they can actually be in Right. Okay. All right. So let's spend a couple minutes just discussing what you saw in the survey. What did you find surprising? What did you not find surprising? Um, how might we use these results in thinking about BCP for for this year. So, anybody want to start? I can start. Okay, I'm always happy to start. Um, Thank you. The big I love thing, having volunteers. Um, volunteers. The big thing that's always stands out to me that is the same thing I'm seeing is um, having an inclusive school wide culture around ACP and also having full participation. This is something you and I have talked about um, that administration, teachers, everybody's like, Abby, what are you doing for ACP? Like we have an ACP meeting, but I'm the only one that's supposed to be providing any sort of information. I mean, the tech ed teacher and the ag teacher, they come with, well, this is what I've been doing. Um, but it's always, what are you doing, Abby? What are you doing, Abby? And that gets really frustrating. And so I'm glad it's not just me. Um, I, <laughs> I, I, it helps me to see that, that a lot of people are struggling with that not surprising. I know you and I have talked about you coming in and, and trying to help with that. So that is just the thing that I always think like, oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, and hopefully I did do that at the beginning of the school year for Bonneville. So hopefully um, you yeah. saw some, yeah. some. She came in and um, <clears throat> explained ACP and that it's not just a counselor thing. And it was for our staff development at the start of the school. So everybody was there. And then um, we had her break out into sessions by department, and she actually got them on Zello and showed them where to log in and how to, right? Like, I'm trying to remember, like, they actually had to get in Zello and look, and Lynn kind of directed them, and so then they kind of had to own that a little bit. Laura and I yeah. sat back going, <laughs> right. yep. Well, and that's another one. It's it's Zello specific too. Well, when are you going to go into classrooms and do Zello? Well, I'm one person where they're with their class every single day. They could just put it in. Hey, let's do a half an hour of Zello. Let's. Exactly. Hey, we're talking about you know math for the trades or whatever. So it's taken how many years? Right. Started in 2017. Right. This year we got admission to uh, administration to finally give us a half an hour a month. It's our ELT time, so it's 26 minutes at the end of the day, one time a month that they do a Zello lesson or whatever we have. We have it on all on a schedule now from September to May or June. Can you share that schedule with me? Sure. It's just yeah. um, Lynn's lessons she's come up with or lessons right okay. in Zello. So that like it's the, it's the second Thursday of the month. And we always have a, staff, a high school staff meeting that Wednesday. So we'll, we have it created. If anybody wants to ask questions, we can explain what to do. And then the next day during ELT, they go through or give directions on whatever that lesson is or whatever. And that so, would work for us because we have a half an hour at the end of every single day. How I'm looking at it, it's a start. They're getting their feet wet. <coughs> um, yeah, so okay, cool. I mean, it's more than what we've ever had in staff meeting before. 
Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, that's I will. I'll link this into the slide deck. Oh, what I those. have done then is based on the fact that I'm hearing now from a Perfect. number of districts that you've got about half an hour, 45 minutes once a month. Um, I put together the lessons that we've created, and so far we've got six through 10. They are based on the Zello scope and sequence, and especially at the beginning, the middle school lessons are very heavy in Zello. Once you start getting into ninth and 10th grade, I start bringing in other resources, but this, um, I put it together into a calendar of once a month activity that's about a half an hour. So literally these are um, lessons that are grab and go. There is zero work that a teacher or a school counselor or anybody who's leading this lesson has to do as far as planning, it's done. They're student facing lessons. So it, it talks directly to the students. It shows them exactly where to go and what to do in order to do this particular lesson. So there are screenshots that tell them, click here, sign in here, then you're going to see this. Now you're going to click on that um, and it leads them through a once a month activity for grades six through 10 with some alternate uh, optional lessons for those who get done faster or just want more to do. Uh, there are a few of those as well, but um, that is something I just finished a, a couple of weeks ago. So I've got it done through 10th grade. We're finishing the lessons for 11th and 12th grade uh, right now. And as soon as those are done, I will uh, include those two pages as well, but I will link that to the slide deck so that if any of you have an interest in a plan that is a calendar that's already done for you and all you have to do is literally like email this to the students and the teachers who are in charge of that particular month and say this is exactly what you do um, this is further proof that you rock Lynn. Oh, oh. yes you do you so <laughs> rock you do this is why we trust you with what you're going to teach us oh, your teacher skills are coming and Val has just joined us, so I'm going to be linking this. I'll link this on the WEX survey for Joe. No, I'm going to create a different page. But Val, be there. you can finish what you're doing. I no, that's okay. It. This is, it's a good break time. We just got done looking at the WEX results. So um, if you have some things that you would like to share uh, and leave the group because Val is new to us this year. So come on over here. Come on in. Do you have people virtually? Yes, we do have people joining. Yep, yeah, we do. We have um, Chris and uh, Sherry are both on. Chris from uh, Pemine and Sherry from uh, Niagara awesome. are joining us as well. I'm glad you were in So this is Val, our new local vocational ed uh, <coughs> local vocational education, education coordinator. coordinator. There we go. Yes, John Nickerbacher, the new John. I don't have the cool black jacket. <laughs> I've heard, or the motorcycle. I've heard that I'm missing out on something. Or the motorcycle. Yes. Great. I don't have any motorcycles, nor do I have the cool black jacket. But I'm working on other things. So, in, in reality, John's been fabulous. He is more than willing to meet with me and help me out with anything I need as this transition happens because when he left, 20 some years of experience walked out the door. Um, my background is in special ed. I've been in special ed for 20 years. So, coming into the CTE role is much different for me. I have to go back to school and enroll with you to learn some things about um, CTE, but I also have a lot of connections uh, throughout the state because of the position. So my pr primary focus right now is the Carl Perkins grant. It was approved in early September. Oh, yeah, <laughs> with a lot of stress in the few years. Um, <laughs> You can start spending, your district should be spending their Carl Perkins funds now because those materials should be used during the school year. Um, anything that was a capital object, so if it was something that was over $5,000 and I did the ordering, I believe all of those orders have been placed and the materials should be coming into districts. Um, the payout this year is going to be a little bit different. In the past, districts have sent in their invoices as they came. This year, I created a Google folder for every district. They're going to put the invoices in there and I'm going to do a payout in March. So you'll get one check for all of the costs for their general purchase expenditures. If you have any revisions that you'd like to make this year yet on your current year Carl Perkins funds, I need to get those revisions as soon as we change the date. Um, I believe the, the due date was October 8th, but there's a little bit of wiggle room. So if there's still anybody that needs to do some revisions, I can have a little bit of time. 
Um, when we get our Carl Perkins funding, we get the initial funding kind of in the spring, and then we get our final allocation in the fall. And of course, they're a little bit different. And so there's always a little bit of money that uh, in the past, John told me he used for professional development. So if there's anything specific to Carl Perkins, career tech ed, special populations um, that you would like to see for professional development, please let me know and I'll see what I can do. I did have someone ask me about grant writing. That's the only one I've heard so far is that people were inter uh, interested in specifically grant writing more CTE. The other thing we could do, CISA 5 has a lending library for their CTE program. So they, when they do their final allocation for Carl Perkins and they have that little bit of money left over, they buy something that districts can borrow for a period of time. So one of the things they purchased was the babies that are kind of the realistic dolls because you wouldn't need that for a whole year. And most small districts can't afford to purchase those, but you can check them out for a month at a time or check them out for your school year. So if there's anything like that that you think of, I would appreciate emails on those as well. They have some specific ones, like if you, some districts already have the regular babies, but they now have babies that have like, um, that are like fetal alcohol syndrome babies. So there are, are um, different special needs babies that you can now get and tons of other simulations now that are available from all different companies that are out there. So sometimes it's nice for a district to, you know, like if you're, um, CTE department is thinking about getting some welding simulations because they don't have a welder. If they could get one to try and see if it's going to work with students, it would be really nice to, to have one that we could lend out to districts to try. And also, CISA 5 has a high high quality drone oh. that all the different departments were using. One of them was using it about football games, and they were taking like the um, the photography class was taking video of the football game from above and then making it into an edited video to post to social media. And then that same drone was used to try and figure out how many acres of forest there was um, in their school forest and the density. So just the diversity of ways you can use some of those tools in a variety of CTP courses. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is the CLNA process, the Comprehensive Local Needs Assessment. We did that two years ago. This is kind of new to me, but it's taking the workforce data, our local data about academic achievement for students and career tech ed courses, and trying to find if there are any gaps or any needs that we have in our area that we should start moving our funding towards so that we can close some of those gaps. Um, special populations like migrant students, homeless students, um, students with disabilities, uh, non traditional roles, those kinds of things um, have been a real focus for DPI during this CLNA. But right now I'm in the process of collecting data for all of your districts. If you gave me access to WiseDash. If you didn't give me access to WiseDash, I'll be sending you a list of data that I need. Um, right now, Oler, Marion, and Gresham, I believe, are the three that gave me access. So if you haven't given me access, I'm going to be sending a list of probably about 60 to 80 data points that will be there. You to pull or somebody in your district to pull. So it's so much easier just to, to it really is. include <laughs> us, yes, at, in your YSAF. Um, Val did send an email out to uh, whoever is responsible for that in your district or to you to ask for both of us actually to get that access because it gives us great data that we can pull on ACP as well. So, um, and it even tells you specifically the type of access that we should get. It's like a there we, it's an isn't it an like economic economic analyst something like that. Yep. Uh, but it's very easy for the person who's in charge of that wise dash in your district to add us um, as that person, and then we can do all of that data collection instead of you having to do it. And then I'll give it back to you. So I have this fancy form uh, <coughs> that I actually borrowed from CISA one that they were nice enough to give us that has all of the things that we'll need for the CLNA. And it shows me where to pull it from. But because so many of our districts are so small, the wide dash public doesn't work for me because I go in and it's <laughs> so small that I get data with that. So uh, there will still be a few things that I can't access, but most of them I can pull out of wide dash. I have uh, the school level access. And we don't ever share any specific student information when we have that access. So it's still very general. 
Um, and adding right on to that. That's a question quick about that. Yep. So I emailed you a bit about that. I want you to do that. Um, and my minute, my superintendent probably has to give you access. Uh -huh. I'm thinking. Did you, can I get an email on exactly what you just said <laughs> in WISE Dash, what access you need? So that I can just say, hey, go in and do this. Did you ask all the districts? I did. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, from um, So I know you emailed me back. Email, was it years. to the BCT teachers or admin? It went to a whole, that initial email went to Whoever the district designee is for Carl Perkins, it went to your superintendent, it went to at least one high school counselor, um, and your business manager or financial manager. So it went to those four. Um, and I actually sent you another email yesterday. <laughs> you know, sometimes your emails, our emails get stuck in your, your spam filters. Oh, no. Also, it's a busy day, so I'm still going through those. No, you're fine, right, but I did, um, I included Carl in it, so that okay. might help move things. Yeah, three of those. Or <laughs> changed in our districts, so that's kind of where I'm like, I just want to make it easy for them all. Yes, like, and I'm not it. sure even who has your highest level of wise access. I would assume it's car. So, but I don't even know either. Um, yeah, I can send an email with that. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, so what I was moving into was that December 7th is our data snapshot. Make sure that you're looking at all of your data that's going into WISE. Um, someone should have access to WISE data in your district and they get a list of errors. A lot of the errors I've seen, at least for the districts I have access to right now, are CPC or CPC errors. Um, those need to be cleaned up by December 7th. So you have a little bit of time, but they are there and I've been seeing them pop up even more. I'm not exactly sure how often DPI tells us what's wrong, I feel like we get new ones every single day. Uh, the last thing I'm working on right now is I've been visiting districts because I don't know anybody um, and I don't know what your programs look like. And it's not very fair for me to give recommendations or to try and answer questions when I've not met the people and don't know what you're doing. Um, and I have to say that I've seen some pretty fabulous things happening in our district. Um, some of the really small districts are doing some really cool things I've never even considered or thought about. I know Leona has this super cool program going where they are connected to the local nursing home and the nursing home is getting some of their staff or some of their students trained to be CNAs and then they work during the school day and it's one of those places that didn't have nearly enough employees so now they're getting the employees they need, students are getting the training they need and those students are going out to do things like be a uh, one of them wants to be a physical therapist, one of them wants to be a physician's assistant, and one of them wants to stay in that job that they're in when they graduate. So it's really great to see some of the things that districts are doing in the creative ways that they're getting to done the course and getting that work experience in those small rural districts. So hopefully I can share some of those if people are getting stuff. The other reason I'm going out is so that I can answer questions or at least collect questions and then hopefully find you an answer. I, um, like I said, I've been in this job for three months, so I don't know all the answers, but I'll do my best to figure them out for you. Any questions about Carl Perkins, CTE? Yeah, I have a question. So is there a time we can just look at that? Like, if there's any money that was budgeted to our district today? Yep. Okay, because I don't want to waste the time here, but I just... It's in your folder. So I shared a folder with you in Google Drive. Okay. Your budget's uh, planning sheet, or your district's planning sheet is in that Google Drive folder that I shared. Okay, I'll look at that then. Because that again are two of the main, all three positions basically are turnovers for CTE. So they don't even know that they have money because they don't know that it exists yet. Okay. <laughs> so but yes, there's a there's a district planning sheet that's in your folder. Okay. And those are the things that you can purchase. We do still have a little tiny window of if they want to make some changes. So we do have a workshop coming up at the end of October, I believe it's the 27th yes. in the afternoon where Val is going to be talking about that comprehensive local needs assessment and then I'm also going to be talking about pathways if there are any local pathways that you have that are able to be transformed into regional current pathways like the one that I showed just a little bit ago with that first page that has all that career ladder with all of the, the links uh, to careers I'm going to actually walk you through how to do that with the available templates that we have right now for uh, the pathways so 
Um, I know that that information went out. Sometimes it went out to like the business person in your district is the person who like submits all the Carl Perkins stuff. I think it would be really, really, really helpful if that's the person that's coming to that meeting to also have either a CTE teacher or you um, with that person because you're going to know a lot more about this kind of thing than your your business person is going to know about in your district. So I would, that information also went out in my initial email. So, so there was a link in there, but you can find it on our CTA website as well. Because yeah. I know, you know there was one district, for example, that it was yeah, the business person um, who, who had already planned to come and had signed up for the meeting. And when the CTA teacher found out about it, when we were talking at the YA meeting, they were like, oh, we need to be there with her because we are the ones that really know what's going on with Carl Perkins funding. Um, once once she gets the money, we're the ones that, that use that funding, so they're kind of along. All right, okay, that's all for the nutshell. Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you. Lynn. All right, all right, very briefly. Um, once again, the DPI is doing community of practice webinars. Last year they were called ACP community practice, this year they're called career readiness community practice. Last year, they were on Wednesdays at the end of the school day, and we <clears throat> had oh, between 40 and 80, I would say, in attendance. We, they decided this year to change things up a bit, so it, it is on Thursday morning from 10.30 to, or 8.30 to 10. We had 120 at the first one, so we were really, really happy about that uh, as far as attendance. So there is, I believe this is, yep, live linked to the Flyers. So if you're interested in signing up for any of the other ones, the first one that we did was on creating a career readiness team and an action plan, which I'm going to very briefly go through because I know that there were a number of you who were at that training. If you missed it and you want to find out what it was all about, there that is available on the DPI website. So you can go to the DPI website and watch the recording of it. But if you want to Register for any of the upcoming dates. Each of these is a live link to the registration for that particular date. So at the first one, we talked about a brand new ACP goal setting protocol that has been created by the DPI. So there is a new form that if you click on this, it actually downloads a your own personal copy of it. And it is There we go. <laughs> so I'm not going to go through as in as much depth as we did at the meeting, but just to, to let you know, um, it's a way for your district's ACP team, and it does start with some suggestions for who should be on your team, uh, but you're for your team to sit down and see where ACP is at right now in your district and then make some plans for what is it that you want to work on for this year. So it goes through some suggestions for who should be on your team, give suggestions for data that you, you should collect because <laughs> everything that we do in education is about data. So how do you know what's working if you're not collecting data around it? So it gives you some data points. Uh, for collecting data that aligns with career readiness and academic and career planning. Then there is the survey, which is similar to the WEC survey, but very, 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 very much shorter. This used to be seven pages, this infrastructure survey. It's now just this little bitty thing, little bitty tab table. Um, but it's a conversation for your ACP team to have around you know, where are we with leadership and culture? Are we just getting started? Is it pretty well implemented or are we completely institutionalized with this? Where are we on policy and planning for ACP, on professional development, on family engagement, on individual ACP support for our students, on community partnerships, and on access for all? Because every single initiative at the DPI is about equity and making sure that especially that our students in those special populations have access. So it, gives your team an opportunity to have conversations about where you are right now. There's a section where it encourages you to create a, an ACP graduate profile. So when students graduate from our institution, we're guaranteeing that this is what they're going to know and be able to do. 
And there are some examples here uh, of other districts that have done this. So uh, if you want to know what a, a profile of a graduate looks like, there's some links there. There's a section for you to map out what's already being done because we know that ACP is being done in every district. It has been for years, uh, but this is a great place to collect all that information. And really, it's about this information at the top. Is this something that is universal for all students? That's really your ACP plan. If it's something that's being done that every student at this grade level gets to do this thing, then it's part of your plan. If that's not the case, then it's a component that's offered, but it's not it's not universal. So it, you're not guaranteeing that all students are going to have this opportunity. So thinking about you know who is doing projects in their classes that students have that it be. That, that's aligning to ACP that students are, are having the opportunity to engage in. Um, what grade level is this being done and how is the component offered? Is it during advisory time? Is it during a class? Is it after school or is it online? But just a, a nice spot for you to start gathering information on what is being done. And then the big thing is, so what's the one? And it can be just one thing. It shouldn't be any more than three, but I think start small. What is like the <coughs> one thing that you really want to be working on this year with your district? Like Bev had talked about the one thing that they worked on this year is they now have one designated time per month to do academic and career planning. So that's what they're going to take advantage of. Um, so once you have determined with your team, this is the thing that we're going to be working on this year, this is the goal. There is then a form, a Google form, to let me know what is it your district is working on. It goes to a Google form, you put in your email, the name of your district, your, your name as the ACP coordinator. Um, we just got done updating your contacts. You can check the box that, yep, I've checked your, my contact information, it is accurate. Uh, we already looked at the Zello contact form, so you can check that box that you've got that done. Um, you're linking to your district's ACP plan. You already did that in the form. You don't necessarily, well, I guess it's going to make you do it because that's not required. Um, so link it again here. Um, briefly describe your ACP implementation. So it could be, we have a 30 minute period once a month for ACP. And then check off what's the goal that your group has decided you're working on this year. If out of these 22 things, nothing applies to what your goal is for your district, click other and type in what you're doing. And the purpose of this is so that when I get the information, each of the ACP coordinators at the CSIS this year is working really as a coach for you. So we have a form that we fill out based on your goal that is a customized PD plan for your district. So once I find out what your goal is, I have got a whole list of resources that I can then link onto this form and send back to you that it could be webinars, it could be articles, it could be um, uh, any number of resources, but that your ACP team can then use in order to accomplish your goal. And so you will get back this form customized for your district with resources for your ACP team use to accomplish the goal that you've selected for the year. And then once you get that plan back, it also gives you a, a schedule at the end so you can kind of chart out meetings that you're going to have with your ACP team, um, who is going to attend the meeting, what you're going to work on for that particular meeting, um, what of the resources that I sent you're going to have your team like watch or read before the meeting in order to prepare. So it's just a, a one spot that you can put everything together that you're going to work on for this year for your leadership, for your ACP leadership team. So uh, the DPI yesterday uh, <coughs> told us that they would really like districts to do this by the end of October and for us to get that PD plan out to you then in November so that you've got a good chunk of time during the year to be working on your PD plan and your goal for the year. So it's not, as with everything with ACP, there's not ACP police. So the DPI is not, and I am not gonna be breathing down your neck if, 
if you have decide that you don't want to be a part of this, but I think anytime that you get free information from your CISOs, you should take advantage of it. So if you, you know, I'm not going to see like this whole form that, uh, which, where did it go? Um, oh. So as you, you know, if you just do this on your own, and you don't have a team get together, I'm not going to see that. If you don't, you know, have not decided what data you're going to collect, I'm not going to see that. All I see is your end goal. So if you already know this is the goal we want to work on, and you just go to the form and fill in your goal, I don't see any of this. This is just information that can help you to come up with your goals. Like how you use this is entirely up to you. But I would absolutely encourage you to fill out the form and let me know what goal you do have. So that I can get resources to you because free resources are always good. So if you would um, on slide 10, think about that during the month of October. I'll send a reminder out for the end of the month saying, hey, don't forget if you know what your goal is for the year, I'd love to send you a customized <coughs> plan. So please, please take advantage of that. All right. Any questions on that before we take a short break? Okay, we are going to take timing here. We are going to take a 10 minute break, so 1040, and then we are going to take a look at the book study and see if that's something that you want to continue to pursue at our other meeting. So 10 minutes to refresh your coffee. Restrooms are right around the corner. There probably are muffins left. Does. Does. So Someone else water. Don't forget to make sure your phone looks charged. Checking in.
Class fill for truck. You might. And then another class fill for truck. I thought this would be the for tomorrow. <coughs> and then I have to put 36 lots of our truck. I don't know, right? Can you hear that popcorn taste like that? Is this ours is for Friday. I see that. Why is this for Friday? No. Mistake that? It says Friday. I have to look at two. Yeah. I can make two mistakes. Good point. And it specifically says. <laughs> I know. I just don't know why. Why would you do it at night? Like, I don't know if he thinks that we're going to share Thursday or not. <laughs> okay. Then I got nothing. I know. Yeah. Well, I wanted to know, like, um, samples. Is there a copy for me for fat free species? Do you make candles? Is there pickles? Yeah, good. Ham? Good. 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 I just say they keep it on there. Right, yeah. Yep. Yes, that's what I'm doing then. There you go. We're bringing the very unhealthy sex when we do that one, so I don't I know. know. I know, right? I don't know what's up. So, <clears throat> this is No, that's, that's, I don't mind doing that. No. Description hard boiled eggs. <laughs> <laughs> eggs that are hard, hard boiled. boiled. I know. Um, who oh, sharing fish and stuff on this? Fruit tray. Fruit on a tray. Sure, it's it's a on the eggs that are cold. <laughs> I loved it. I was like, that's awesome. I'll see you on Monday, right?
I just want to drink soda. I don't want to have you. Uh, that I don't know. I can't. I'm telling you, I can't. No, I was going to go actually to the one place that everyone wants to eat. That's what I wanted to get. Yeah, just eat it in your Yep, that's great. Don't bring it into the one. And even then, you're choosing to let them choose. Yeah, I don't think I said I'm really about fighting. This is a big goal. I have yet another yeah. question for you. Like, so ideally, all three of us would like, be but I think at the least, me and David, or David and David, no, me, me and David, <laughs> take out the David. <laughs> um, yeah, but now, that's Kim Nineveh was saying, well, really, we should find out the specifics of each meeting and decide who we should send. And I, do you, how, how much time before the actual event do you usually send out? Not really, though, right? Well, right. usually, yeah. I I would have sent out more information beforehand, um, but yeah. I just got back from vacation on. Right. Where'd you go? Tuesday night, Ireland. Ooh. Or for 12 days. So, yeah. So, I was okay. still working on what exactly this was going to look like last night. Usually, I'm <laughs> much more prepared than that. Yeah, I was so, trying to remember, like, how, how much before these meetings have been, would there, would there be time between when you share the specifics and the meeting to get registered? Yeah. Like, if it didn't apply to me at all, or David, which I can't imagine, it right. wouldn't. Yeah. So, um, next time, for sure, I know we're doing awesome. the community practice webinar Impressive. along with the rest of the state. For sure, Tam is going to be sent, uh, sharing information about the new math standards, which yeah. may have an impact yeah, on, on your math classes. Well, yeah, but... do, actually. Um, and then for sure, I'm going to do the afternoon okay. on poverty um, on that. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. And okay. I mean, that information is, it's so good. Yeah. So I'm thinking that we all three of us definitely right. need to prepare for mm -hmm. that part of it. Um, but then they, they, oh, yeah. they probably have to come for tea <laughs> before the morning. Um, is it math standards in elementary as well? Except it'll, it'll, it'll be, be all down. Yeah, yeah. I, I, as far as I know, the math standards yeah. have, yeah, it's a complete it's rewrite a complete of the math overall. standards. Yeah. And so the poverty one starts at? That'll be in the afternoon. So that'll be 30 ish. Yeah. I'll just say 12 o'clock. Definitely all three of us should be at that. So maybe I could come the whole day. They could come first. <laughs> um, yeah, and like I said, so I know sometime we're going to do the trauma informed care because that's something that people want to express for me. But I'll know well in advance of that. Yeah, I think we're going to come into that part. So, yeah, I'll know. I do so, do so generally, I will send you guys the information ahead of time about what exactly we're going to do. And how much time we decide we want to do that, we'll always have to have an hour. And I kind of like each chapter. Yeah, <laughs> 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 
All right, thank oh, you for yeah, yeah. that yeah. Yeah. I remember one here so much yeah. 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 I didn't learn like that. a lot of this in grad school. Didn't like, I didn't oh, right. yeah. oh, we're we're yeah. 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 So we are yeah. I know. At least we're not, I'm not the only person that yes. I I didn't I um I was able to get from actually Tammy got these. I have no idea how she was able to get them, but we have uh, a set, I think of 30. Um, of these powerful partnership books from Scholastic is a teacher's guide to engage the family for student success. It's a very easy read. The chapters are pretty short. And then I found a really nice book study guide that went along with it. So the plan is that at each of our meetings, we will spend just half an hour um, doing the, the book study on that particular chapter. And I'll always send out ahead of time the information, uh, the book study guide. So that way, um, you will have that that you can work on the whole month before. So I will get actual copies out to Kira. I'm sending yours with Craig. And then Chris and Sherry, I'm up in your neck of the woods next week, Wednesday, for the meeting that we have at Aurora, right, Zach? Um, the, your uh, industry advisory yeah. meeting is next week, so I will bring copies up for you guys and drop them off either with your superintendents or I will come to your school. You will get actual physical copies of this, but for today, I scanned the introduction. It is linked on slide 12. I did, on my computer, I changed it so that it was facing the right way, and then when it saved it, it went back to this way. So I don't know how to make it go back horizontal so that you can read it correctly, but I tried. Um, but the introduction is in there and then we have an introduction study guide and that's what we're going to take a look at today. So the, the, the idea behind the book is just to get more ideas about how to engage parents. And we know, especially when we're looking at um, it seems like it, it tapers off as students get older, once they get into middle school and then definitely into high school, that parent involvement is something that uh, sometimes districts struggle with. So uh, the idea behind the book is just to give you some more strategies for inviting parents into your space and being part of what's happening in your district. So if you are online, if you would like to open up the, the text, copy of the introduction and the book study and have those open on your computer and here in the room we have paper copies of the book study and the actual book. So we're going to just take a look at the introduction today, which is 15 pages and um, yeah, it's, it's a, like I was uh, telling Abby, it's a, a pretty fast read each month, um, the introduction especially. You're going to do just that. Introduce, so it's, uh, it isn't going to take us very long. So, looking at the very first question, um, and you can either, if you want to open and create a copy and type in your responses, or if you want to write them on the sheet, or you just want to type in your head what the answers are, uh, we'll talk about them as we go along. But the very first page says the introduction begins by touching on four situations that bring teachers a sense of well being and accomplishment. And I'm just going to read through that first paragraph and those four scenarios. And the question is, how do you personally measure success based on the four examples that they have? Can it be found within the four ideas bulleted on the very first page in the chapter? Or do you measure success differently? So this book is written with you, the teacher and school counselor. I'm going to add in mind, it begins with the premise that all teachers want to be and feel effective as teachers. Teachers want more than anything to see their students making progress academically, developmentally, and socially. We know that you as a teacher and school counselor feel a sense of well-being and accomplishment when, and here are the four scenarios. Your students are engaged and excited by what they're learning in class and are motivated to practice what they've learned. All of your students are showing growth in academic and social emotional benchmarks and have in some way made steady progress. You see their progress reflected in student data as well as in your observations of them in the classroom or in the district. 
and your students feel more connected to their peers, their teachers, and their school community. So if you would spend a, a moment thinking about that first question, how do you personally measure success for your students? Is it one of the ways that, or all of the ways that are described in that first paragraph that we just read? Or do you have other measurements of success for your students? And if so, what those are. Think about that for a minute. We will have some more shares. All right, so who would like to share when you think of success for your students? <clears throat> these things, is that what you, your, you, how you measure success for your students, or what are some other things that you think about? Great. I think for, as I look at the, the four things, I think all four of those in some way I, I use measure success, but I probably would say I'm less inclined to look at data when I'm looking at that more intangibly, I'd say. It would, how they're, how they're interacting with me. You know, I, I say I look at more of a connectivity with the peers in, in, in the classrooms um, and, and just their general engagement in, in putting some of these things that we're talking about into practice and utilizing if they're having troubles coming in to see me or so that they can kind of work on some of some those parts to improve some of their, some of their skills. Mm -hmm. But I would say I'm not I'm not necessarily like, so like number like a number driven like I gotta see a number on the chart to see <laughs> she'll see if they're having success or not. Mm -hmm. But more through conversations and more through some of the responses that we're getting in the classroom, whether it's in classroom banks times or or uh, just one on one times. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Great. And yeah, I absolutely agree when it comes to data. Well, like to share what you think about success for your students. I agree that these are great ways to measure success. I also agree that it's sometimes it's not about the data because we're not really the numbers people. We're the ones that take care of people. And I was also thinking that I measure, it's kind of like my success, but also their success when students are willing to seek me out to ask me for help or to advocate for themselves because then that shows that I've done my job by making it known that I'm someone they can trust and they're growing by advocating for themselves. Awesome, I love that. Other ideas? Yeah, I definitely like seeing the elementary kids using what I've taught them in classrooms, so. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, how about online? Anyone online wanna share what you think, what, how you measure student success? Yeah. Oh, here. Here. <laughs> Sorry, I'm juggling everything right now. Um, as I'm trying my best to keep up here, but um, as we talk about student success, one of the first things that immediately pops up for me 
is um, a personal sense of achievement. Um, this is a, does a student feel proud of themselves? Do they acknowledge that, hey, I did something that I couldn't do before, that I wasn't as successful in before? So that personal sense of achievement for me is one of my, it's the first thing that kind of comes up for me when I think about how I measure student success, because success is going to mean differently, different things to different students. And as I'm very aware of, um, you know, that I'm able-bodied, that I can, I can do all these things. You know, I acknowledge that um, what I define as success for someone like me is going to look differently for students that maybe don't have all the same things that other students have. Great, thank you for that, Kira. Chris, did you have something to add? I think if kids are actively engaged and enjoying what they're doing and, and having appropriate behavior while they're doing it and and having some success i think whatever is going on is is working mm -hmm. okay great love those answers uh, if we continue on that same page the next paragraph talks about a variety of factors that contribute to an educator's success so the book tells us in order for you to achieve the best possible results for your students we know certain factors have to be present. Your school has to be led by a leader who is competent and is a positive driver of change. You need to be surrounded by colleagues who are skilled and competent. You need to receive great instructional guidance and support, and there must be very strong ties with the families and community members that your school serves. All of these ingredients have to be present and working together for your school to run well and for your students to have successful outcomes. So based on those success factors, that is listed under number two, competent positive leaders, skilled co-workers, strong family ties, instructional guidance and support, and strong community ties. And this is a, a continuum from no impact to large impact. So the question is, place the success factors, and you can just use the numbers in front of them, on the continuum below to indicate how much of an impact you believe they have on your own success. So how much does uh, having a competent, positive leader have an impact on your success from no impact to a large impact? Um, you may also add your own key contributors if you feel they are, are missing, be ready to share the factor that affects your success the most and why it has that impact. So if you would take a minute or two to list the numbers on this timeline or the, on this continuum from no impact to large impact as to what, how these success factors impact your success and then we'll share. We're just going to go around the room and have everyone share what of those five success factors, what do you think has the most of an impact on your personal success and why is that that this particular factor is so important in making sure that you're successful in your career. So we'll start with Zach on this end. What's the most important success factor for you? Well, I looked at the book. <laughs> And the book said we got three of us. That's what the book I just wanted to make is. sure the answer was in the book. For there is no right answer. Well, it says the, the research suggests. Oh, research. Anyways, but um, 
I don't know. I guess I, I couldn't really pinpoint one. I mean, I just looked at some of it and it's like, yeah, number one is important, positive leader, but also sometimes just need a leader is not going to get in your way. Right. So you don't care if they're competent or positive. You just don't want to be meddling and, and interfering. Right. So like, because sometimes they're not helpful either way. They don't have the skill set for it. You know, so like that's other people's job. So if they're willing to just let it go, you know, so like that could be, so it kind of depends. I think um, the skilled coworkers probably and the family ties too. I, I kind of felt down with this. Skilled <laughs> coworkers and also flexible growth mindset coworkers. Ah, well, and that way, not just, you know, some skilled coworkers can be very rigid in how they do things because they're so skilled. Mm -hmm. So being able to learn new things is more important sometimes than having all the knowledge you need. Because that's how we work in our, we don't know everything. We don't know what we're gonna get from day to day. So no matter how skilled we are in the area, we're still gonna get something every week that we don't know what to do with. So, so I kind of looked at families and coworkers <laughs> as being maybe the most okay. right now. I could okay. change my mind. <laughs> and I love adding that growth mindset. I think you're right, that is so important because you are going to run into a situation that you're not skilled in. Yeah. Like if you have a growth mindset, you'll still be successful in that. So, excellent. All right, so I actually, with being new, obviously, I kind of critiqued number four a little bit instead of saying, that could have been a base for teachers, like instructional, but I think for me, guidance and support is not huge. Obviously, I'm only two months in <laughs> to being like at, you know, home in fully, but um, so for me, I think just guidance and support right now for my success is a big factor because I'm still obviously learning so much okay. and having someone there for, so for me personally, that's, Biggest factor for me, but um, I would say I know how important strong family ties are. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I'm trying to grow into to kind of help connect families, and that's part of my role. So I can see how that's super important as well. So those are the two. Of course, that's what the book is about. So it's going to say that's most important. So for me, Tiger's in a super small, obviously. Um, strong family ties and then instructional guidance <laughs> and support are my top two, just because. We are so small and our families are so close and there's not many of us in the district. So the support it really is needed just because we take on so many tasks. Yeah. Definitely. Smaller the district, more tasks you have. Yep. Michelle? I guess my line of thinking is number one because without number one, you can't do two, three, four, or five. It's just how I'm thinking. So I'm going with a competent, positive leaders get the rest of it done. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I did three, the strong family ties, because if I don't have permission from the parents, I can't be with my kids individually or in groups. So mm -hmm. I feel like I need to have a really strong connection with them in order to get that permission. So, okay, great point. Great. I would say for mine, I was number two, but I would say when I look at skilled co-workers, I would say I, I had a problem with the word skilled. I guess what I would say is caring. Mm -hmm. Because I would say that if, and I know in Marion, we're very big on SEL, we're building relationships with the kids. And those teachers that really reach out to and build those relationships with those kids can do great things in their classroom that kids will, kids will soak up whatever they're trying to teach as long as, as, long as they have that relationship. But those, some of those teachers that struggle a little bit with making those relationships also it goes hand in hand with kids kind of wanting to learn the information too, because sometimes that gets in the way a little bit of the, of them being able to want to learn the material and do their success in that class as well. So I, I would say the co-workers part, I think is, is, is huge, but I think it's more on the caring side than the, the relationship building part that is necessarily competence part of it. Because I would say, I have a teacher that's not as competent, like, like you may, may not, and by that I mean like maybe not top the line, not knowledge thing, but with the relationship stuff, even if they're like middle of the road or above, the kids will kids will be able to take that stuff and do well. Great, I love that. Um, so I did one and four are large impact for me, I think. Uh, positive, competent, and instructional guidance and support. Um, as far as giving me the tools to do well for my students. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> whereas I kind of put family ties, I love to have family ties, but around here we have a lot of parents that 
we got a lot of kids that need the support that the parents aren't giving them. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, as much as a connection I want, that would be the support we're, we're not going to get from our families. So, um, getting it from, you know, guidance, support, and a positive leader is definitely higher on the list. Um, I would say strong family ties are really important, but I also agree that I don't think a lot of kids get a lot of strong support from families as much as maybe they did 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I do the coworker thing. I'm kind of agreeing with Zach. Skilled, if that, in, if, if that includes the caretaker, because um, we have a lot of really, I think, very supportive teachers of students and willing to do just about anything to help kids succeed. So um, I don't know if that's skilled or just having a heart mm -hmm. or what, but. I would agree probably with three and two and three. Things go smoothly when you have family ties. Yes. <laughs> More smooth, I should say. Yeah, <clears throat> All right. I agree with everything everybody <laughs> said. Um, because I put one and two. Um, but then also, yeah, you have to have those family ties because you're not going to get very far. But then sometimes the family ties aren't there. Uh, sometimes you anger the families or communities with doing what's right. Um, but for me, I agree with someone who said having a positive or, and confident, competent leaders, that's huge. I need someone to look to for guidance in situations where I'm not sure to do. And when I don't trust or believe in my leader, it's really, really hard for me to feel like I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. All right. Chris, what do you think? I think having us. Um, a supportive, competent leader is critical because I've had ones that are not. Um, and I have one that is now, I truly feel very supportive and very competent. Um, there's where I've heard other people say, it's nice to have a skilled coworker, but it's more important, I believe, to have not only the skills, but also have the compassion and the understanding that these kids all have some traumas in their lives. And oftentimes, it's an amazing thing that they even make it to school, um, let alone actually function. Um, so we, I really firmly believe in, in having very strong, compassionate work uh, co-workers. And we don't always get that. Um, family ties, again, not, we, we don't always have strong families. Um, sometimes we are the family at school. Um, it's nice to have support from your teachers and your administration. And it's nice to have community support. Um, I've seen many school districts that have great community support and and it, it's just absolutely astounding to me and so many schools don't have that um and it just it it makes my heart sad that you know a lot of schools are are begging the the community to back them and the community doesn't take really take that advantage and see that how good a district is all right, great. You're up. All right, so I'm really struggling to select one, but I have it narrowed down between three and um, three, four, and five because, um, you know, uh, for me, one of the biggest, one of my, one of the things that brings the most joy to my heart, makes me feel most successful, is when I see students, you know, using the skills that they're learning, um, whether whether it's in counseling or guidance or any other SEL related activities. But I also acknowledge that, you know, I need the parents to be on board with that and to be also, and to be using the same language that we're using at school and to reinforce these ideas. So, um, fam strong family ties is huge for me, um, as well as the instructional guidance and support. You know, I'm. I, I hope I'm not, I mean, I don't think I'm speaking just for myself when I say that sometimes the school counseling career can be lonely and, you know, we're out mm -hmm. on an island and, you know, so having, um, getting guidance and support from somewhere is tantamount to me. Um, it just, I, I need that. Um, 
but then I also think about the community ties, you know, Marion, while we're a small community, you know, we're very tight knit. And as I think reflect on my job or like my other, the other hats I wear in my profession, you know, I think about all the things that we are able to do simply because we have strong ties to the, to local businesses and the community in general. So three, four and five for me. Great. Yeah. And really um, yeah, good points. And, you know, when you talk about that it can be a lonely job, I mean, when we went around, there are any number that are K-12 uh, in their districts that you're the only school counselor in the district. And even if you, uh, you do have uh, another person, they're probably in a different building. You don't get to see them very often uh, or have, you know, time to connect over what you're doing with your job. So I absolutely uh, understand that, that feeling. Jerry, do you have... The opportunity to share? Um, sure. Uh, I, I kind of agree with uh, most everyone, um, number one and number four. Um, but the reason uh, number one is so important is that confident, that confident, positive leader, I think are good role models for some of our kids. We don't like, we don't have a lot of industry. We don't have, it, um, so a lot of our kids, they're, um, they're laborers and I think they need to aspire to something and they don't often see that. And I think those positive role models not only help them say, hey, they can be successful, um, but if you partner that along with um, the instructional guidance and say, hey, yeah, you can do these things, um, they not only see it in, um, in practice, but then it's reinforced by uh, the, the impact that they can do it. So that's kind of why I chose the one and the four. Yeah, great points about the importance of role models in, in uh, communities, especially smaller. Um, I'm not going to read through all of this, which you'll be really happy to know. Uh, but number three talks about just that the research behind it, those family partnerships and the importance of them shows that when students, when families are more engaged, children's grades go up, children uh, attend school more regularly, they're more likely to enroll in higher level programs. They're more likely to graduate from college. They're more excited and positive about school and learning, and they have fewer discipline problems inside and outside the classroom. I don't think anybody would be too surprised to hear that the more engaged uh, the parents are, the, the more positive impacts that it has on students. Um, you'll see in the book that there are in every chapter some occasions um, where we have, will have notes from Eileen where she actually chimes in about specific um, instances where she's had parent impact by having that connection with family on a particular student. So uh, Porky's reading progress is in that next section. Um, I thought it was really interesting that the, the question on page seven says, what happens if my school board leader isn't on board or school leader isn't on board? I, I can't imagine a school leader who would not want to encourage family participation as much as possible. Um, so I, I thought that was an interesting notion that a school leader would not want to be established in that. Um, of course, uh, in the, the next question says, I already have so much on my plate. Absolutely, that is uh, across the board with school counselors, with uh, teachers, with any staff, with administrators. Um, having one more thing, is not something that um, everybody has capacity for, but it talks about the fact that you know the more that you have families on board, the, the that it actually takes some things off of your plate because you're sharing the responsibility with those parents. Um, parents not having time as well, we know that that absolutely is the case. And then we have uh, another note from Eileen where she talks about family engagement and her survival as a teacher. I did want to look at number four in the. Uh, guide, which says, uh, you know, you're going to see examples in, throughout the book of teachers' personal reflections on family engagement in the classrooms. This is an opportunity for you to think about not uh, specific families necessarily, but um, if you can think about, and, and I'd like to have a share out around this, an example of a positive family relationship that you have, and what is it that makes them relationship positive? What is it that when you think about that particular parent um, that you uh, that is very involved with their students, like what is it that makes that a positive 
relationship with that family. And then maybe an example again in general um, of a difficult family relationship and what are some things that make difficulties with some families that you try to reach out to. So I'd like you to think about that and maybe jot down a couple of notes um, so that we can share out about that. Um, maybe just some general factors that make for a positive relationship with families versus a difficult relationship with families. I'll just take volunteers for this. Um, so what are some components of a positive family relationship versus a difficult family relationship? Okay. Well, I would say something that's really solidified a lot of my family, positive family relationships has been the conferencing part of my job, that being able to speak with parents and kids about their child individually, about just knowing them on a very personal basis, what their goals are, what are some of the things that they're trying to achieve, and what are some of the successes that they've had there, and has really been able to kind of springboard into other conversations with those families and going forward where they felt like a, a they feel very um, comfortable being able to reach out to me for not just when there's issues, but also just some other, just talking to me in other, other avenues too. Um, but I think that kind of building those individual relationships with those families and getting them to kind of, and, and again, with those word of mouth is always a, a really great advertisement for those that when they have these positive experiences, other families tend to kind of jump on these things too as they hear about them too. So it's not, not necessarily an isolated, isolated incident, but I think, just being able to have those positive conversations with parents. And so it's not just me. I like to call you in so we can talk about an issue or things like that, which is always never a fun time for a parent to come in and, and have those conversations. But um, on the opposite side, I would say the difficult times are when those parents really aren't engaged with, with things or it, and a lot of times it's, even if I'm trying to reach out to them in a positive manner to try and establish these relationships, they kind of shut those things down. Um, it's tough to, I can still do be able to work with this, with their child, but it's but it's much more difficult when there's really not a, a lot of support at home to be able to want to engage in that whole process and everybody kind of feel like this is just a school thing and not really like their their thing that they want to engage in. Yeah. Sort of along those lines, I just think if you can start um, with a, with a student or family on a positive note. 
because sometime down the line there might not be such a positive note. But I think if you always can establish a positive relationship right off the bat in regards to, I mean, hey, your child did this today, and what an awesome thing, or just kind of have that practice of establishing positive things. And then when things maybe aren't so positive, it won't be such a bad, hard hit. Because mm -hmm. I know I've been in situations where I'm the first point of contact of a failing grade or not graduating or whatever, and that doesn't go well. Yeah. Yep. I see a lot. I'm going to start with my difficulty. Um, half of our students come from the neighboring reservation, Stockbridge Muncie Reservation. And so I see a lot of issues arise with like cultural differences and a, honestly, a, just a mistrust for white people a lot of times. And it's not even just non native people, it's specifically mistrust for white people, which can be understood in a lot of situations. And so I found over the years, best thing to do is like you saying, like help. Uh, share the positive things like share as much positive as you can because often you're the one who's contacting like eh, I hate to let you know they're not on track to graduate but if you have shared as much positive as you can they're going to be like oh gosh thanks for letting me know how can we get back on track rather than like never heard from you before great thanks that's <laughs> wonderful yeah. I think also um helping in difficult situations helps you gain trust going above and beyond like these are all things that a family would see you doing and be like, wow, you really do care and have that connection with you. Um, so what I find difficult is parents helping us, I guess, you know, so that camaraderie, like, hey, we call a parent, hey, you know, you're kid is, you know, not listening, we're having difficulty in class, and, you know, what can we do to help them, and, you know, one student in particular that, you know, mom finally did take them to get tested and stuff, and they are ODD and ADHD, but yet we're still having the same issues, so we, you know, when we call to ask for other information, like, you know, is he taking his medicine regularly, and what else, you know, can we do? You know, we're not getting those phone calls back and whatnot, and, and they're just the parent, the parents that we need to be there aren't there. Um, you know, whereas the great communication is when you have that those families that uh, have the strong ties, they're oh yeah, you know, we can nip that in the butt, no problem. And I'm like, all right, you know, great. Um, but we do have so many kids in need that just don't have that. You know, parent relationship won't call us back, won't answer the phone, right. you know, um, you know, so I see that that's, a, you know, a huge downfall where I think a lot of and districts and families and stuff and, um, you know, when you can have that, when it can be positive, hey, you know, this is how we, you know, this is what they did today and, mm -hmm. and that's great, but most of the time I think in our position it's a you know, phone call because something happened in class or whatever, and you know you're there to help, but they're not helping you help your their child. Yeah. And it, yeah. And even if if it's a positive phone call, if you can leave a message and they hear something positive, maybe mm -hmm. the next time they don't pick up the phone. Yeah. So yeah, great point, Holly. I had a few. Um... So I was just kind of going down because it's really easy to go <laughs> the negative route. I got three mm -hmm. positive, and I'm like, let's jump over the negative. <laughs> um, and then I had to remind myself that, like, you know, they're good positive things too. But I was just thinking, like, gratitude that goes both ways. Like, if you're grateful for them and you show it as a parent, because as some of us, I don't know if everyone's a parent, but it's not easy to be a parent. So, um, and then respect <laughs> even those disagreements. But sometimes I don't think they're doing it right. <laughs> And, and it's not going to work, but I can still respect the fact that they're trying and that we can work with trying. Um, and the biggest one I've seen over the years is just communication method that goes back and forth. Um, we get too archaic, I think. We think phones and emails work, and they don't. And so I've switched more to texting, and every parent responds to a text, text, every single one. So I think just changing the how you communicate with people really is everything because you know finding a way to do that and some parents you know, i'm not going to go twitter but um <laughs> yeah, <no>. just <laughs> if you want to connect with a parent you got to find a way to communicate with them or else there's no there's no connection so yeah 
point. So when you do that with texting, do you go through like a, an app so that they don't have your actual uh, phone number? I, or? Thankfully, and maybe not thankfully, I have a school cell phone. Okay. Oh, that's nice. So if you don't have that, you might want to recommend like getting a school cell phone for either the office or <coughs> something. I think we use I think we use something called WhatsApp. What's I think WhatsApp. Yeah. Yeah. Other two, which is the thing way. that went down this week. Yeah. Yes. I did. Me yeah. on Monday. Yeah. I know that's why I know that we have another our staff that will do that one. There's a way to text. They can text through it. It's and it's a that's not going to deal with the personal cell phone number. Elementary teachers use Class Dojo a lot. There's a lot of apps out there. Yeah. I just yeah. think. Whatever's gonna work, you use it, and you find a way to use it because that's the end goal. Like, get through to parents if it's so important. Find a way. Doesn't matter what app you use or whatever. Have a backup plan too. Yep. Send yeah. certified yeah. letters. Have, multiple different things. Have someone go to their house. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Just get that communication going. Yeah. It's right. usually not something we see in the public schools as much, but I know parochial schools, especially at the elementary level, like August is physical vis home visits. And it's uh, that's you can get that. Access, but, yeah. There's there's also oh I'm sorry, um just quick Google also has an app you can go through it'll generate some fake uh, yeah, number for you but it still number. comes to your phone so I don't understand the difference between having your personal number and your yeah so that's all yeah sorry Craig. Well, if you're doing that that you do something like yeah that. I was gonna say too you know one of the things that seems to work for me as well as is the training get involved in a lot of the different activities that are going on within our school and community too. So it's it's like if it's just like working a volleyball game or going to a play mm -hmm. that, that they're doing you're, you're being involved in various and being present at different activities so that the community sees you as part of that too. And it's an opportunity for them to just kind of can get to know you a little bit too on a more personal way rather than just kind of those more formal conferences that mm -hmm. tend to be a little bit more stressful for parents. But I found that that's a great way to, to make those initial relationships with, with families and get the, uh, say, oh, who's that? And well, that's, you know, that's the school counselor. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you know, most of them probably, you know, just in general, don't, won't come into the school looking for me, you know, yeah. like, uh, in, in that capacity and totally get to know you. Yeah, that is a great point. And that is for any staff. Parents mm -hmm. and students will absolutely see when you are there, when you go to the play, when you go to the, the musical, when you at the concert when you're at the game um that's huge in in relationship building with families and with students themselves when they see that you're there um, that they have staff there to support them it's amazing to me how important that is to kids you'll think they don't see you or they but they do. always do it's like the next at the high school level oh yeah, yeah. Kind yeah of the high like, school oh. yeah. Saw you at the game. Did you see you. that? Did you see that home run? Oh, you know I was there. Yeah, I saw you. Yeah. You were at my game. You know, yeah. it's huge. Yeah, even to the older kids, the eighteen-year-olds, they oh, yeah. still care. Starting off the year with the shot of bear. I mean, kids mm. would know it. You oh, were yeah. in the building that you saw their animals or you saw their photography mm -hmm. or you know they absolutely that was huge. I think it's huge too, and I don't know that you know what age kid makes this this connection but like okay you're paid to be there all day right you're paid to be their counselor but when you go to their games or their plays and all of that stuff that's on your own time you're not getting paid to be their counselor at that time and i think it matters more than we realize so. yeah absolutely so i'm really glad you brought that up um, I'm not going to go through everything, but the next page does talk about uh, looking ahead to the chapters that are coming up. So we're going to be looking at uh, examining your core beliefs, harnessing the power of partnerships, welcoming, honoring, and connecting with your families, transforming your family conferences and IEP meetings. I know that um, back in the day, just as an example, I was I was at Bonwell with Doug for, I don't know how long you were there. I was there for 20 years. Um, but one of the things that we found was the spring parent teacher conferences were not working. Nobody was showing up. So back then, I don't know if that's still the case, but we instead changed that spring parent teacher conference to that was their scheduling night. That was when the FAFSA meeting was. We had a lot more parent interaction when it was scheduling their kids for the next year and talking about their their ACP opportunities than it was for parents to come in and talk about what was happening in the class. And we That's added right. to that showcase evening. Were you yes. doing that? Yes, I came to. Yes. So showcase. kids showcased their work. The tech ed kids showed whatever they made. The, I mean, just through all the departments, just kind of just showed their highlights of what they did that 
English works or yeah, whatever. Every class we pick like one project that the kids Art. did and we have it out in the hallways. So we have to go around and see what kids said we're done. Yeah. Yeah. And that really just that one change transformed the number of parents that that participated and actually came to the district and ever did when we had regular parent teacher conferences. So thinking about things like that. Uh, chapter five, maintaining strong family ties throughout the year, and then chapter six, supporting your work with, with family, friends, and resources. So we will um, dedicate a half an hour, like I said, of each of the, the meetings to uh, digging into the book and uh, looking at stuff. So we'll have a, a guide like this for each time. So I will email that to everybody ahead of time. So you have an opportunity to read through the book and if like I said, it's just it's a pretty easy to read. Uh, some of the things we can very much just skim. Uh, and that we will when we get together. So if you have the guide done already, then we will just have more time to share what your answers are to different things. So that is the plan for the, the book study. Um, usually, I will, and Abby and I had talked about this, generally ahead of meetings, I'll let you know like what the agenda is going to be specifically so you know if there are other folks at your school that you think should come to the meeting because we're going to be covering this particular topic, you'll know ahead. This time I just didn't have the opportunity to do that because I was on vacation until the end of the day on Tuesday, so I was still putting this together uh, at the last minute, which is not how I usually do this. So uh, we will definitely, uh, you'll know ahead of what we're doing, um, especially with November being that full day, I'll make sure that there is an agenda, but for sure I know we will be sitting in on the uh, community practice for, uh, with the DPI, we will definitely have Tammy here to talk about the uh, math standards and we definitely will have spending up here to take a look at poverty and poor practices and uh, that foundations of poverty. So if I have anything else, I will make sure that that gets sent to you. And the lunch should be here any second if it's not here already. So the very last thing uh, on the last slide at CISA 8, we're always all about continuous improvement. So we like to know that what we're providing you is having a positive impact. So if you would on uh, slide 13, click into the tiny URL and it sends you to a survey just to let me know if there are things that I'm not covering that you uh, need to know about uh, or suggestions that you have. I would love you to fill out the customer satisfaction survey and let me know uh, how I'm doing. And Betty, I'm assuming, is looking in because lunch is available? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> so you have time for the survey first. Yep. And then lunch will be here. But the other people are going to start filtering. Okay, and yeah, so the rest of the yeah, folks welcome. are going to be coming. So, thank you so much for for joining me this morning on getting the school council network back off again. I think it's very exciting that uh, we're able to meet in person again. Uh, hopefully, that continues through uh, the rest of the year. I know Dave is keeping a very close eye on what's happening, especially with the uh, COVID counties and the kind of county since that where we're located. So that's why we now are encouraging masking once again because apparently the numbers have been going up. Hey, Lynn. Yep. Are we going to be able to do webinars? I I'm never able to get out of this building. <laughs> Seriously, it's like um, every time that we do this, we will absolutely have a Zoom option, and I also recorded it. Oh, so I yeah. will after the they meeting is upload right that to YouTube, so I don't be able to come at all. I will have that available after. Oh, God bless you! Thank you so much. No you are problem. like my major hero. <laughs> I try, Chris. You do well. <laughs> I second that. <laughs> so thanks so much for coming. I'm going to uh, close out the Zoom, but thanks uh, for joining us online as well. And I uh, have a great month and we'll see you hopefully in November. Thanks, Lynn. Yep. Thank you.